Coming up on Regarding Men, murderous, psychopathic woman was kind at heart. Well, hello, one and all. I'm Paul Elam of paulelam.com, and this is Regarding Men, where we hold men in high regard and where red pill isolation comes to die. And I am joined, as always, by two of my favorite people on this planet, Janice Fiamingo of the Fiamingo Files and Tom Golden of menaregood.com. Men good. And we've got a couple of stories today. Uh, we've got a rape lie story. Oh, I know you're shocked. That sort of thing never happens. But we have found a rare incidence of it that we're going to address. Uh, but first, the, the big story right now, uh, Deidre, or I guess that's how you pronounce her name, Deirdre um, Morley uh, of Ireland, 43-year-old woman, was depressed. So naturally, she killed all three of her children and um, suffocated them to death. I had to dig and dig and dig to get the cause of death on those children. I had to find, uh, go through about 10 or 15 stories and finally one mentioned uh, that it looked like she had suffocated all three of them. Uh, apparently feeling uh, depressed. Obviously there is some sort of mental health issue here. I don't think anybody would deny that. Nobody in their right mind kills their children. Nobody in their right mind kills anybody uh, unless they're uh, in self-defense. But what's more important now, uh, two things have happened. One, this woman has been declared competent to stand trial. She's going to be able to stand trial for her her crime. Uh, but the public response, particularly on Twitter, uh, is about what you would expect from a gynocentric society. Uh, it, is, it is complete with people pointing some sort of dispersion at the father, who is one of the victims mm -hmm. of this uh, and also pointing out this was a nurse. Uh, she was a nurse. So how could she be a bad person? Uh, just for a point of reference, and though I want to point out that Mark Lapine's mother was a nurse and that Mark Lapine himself worked in a hospital uh, and part of his duties were in patient care. Uh, so uh, I don't think working in a hospital necessarily gives you an out for being a great person. But hey, if you're female, that appears to be enough because the feed on Twitter was all kinds of gushy, warm, oh my God, that poor woman. Not those poor dead children, not that poor father who will never be able to hold his children again, just that poor woman. And I can promise you there will probably be more outcries of public support as the, the trial progresses. Uh, Tom, can we go ahead and put that, that story up there? Sure can. And, and one thing I wanted to, to point out earlier, we have another graphic, if you can place it. Something she said regarding the murders, I think, is a key for me. And I sent in a graphic on this. Let's see. Oh, Tom comes through with the, the tech work. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, this woman, she felt that she could not continue to live and did not want to leave her children behind her. She told Garda, and I don't know who that is, that she wanted to save her children from the pain and suffering she felt lay before them because of her shortcomings as a parent. She had intended to kill herself after she killed her children. Well, for somebody that intended to kill herself, she did a real shitty job of that, wasn't able to execute it. But more importantly to me, this statement, she was willing to kill her children because she was in that, it all came back to her. Everything comes back to her. This was a selfish, crazy act and again, I know there's mental health issues here. I don't think there's any mental health issues that should exclude her from being held accountable for her actions. She had, uh, by the way, apparently drugged the children the night before she killed them uh, uh, and lending some sort of notion of premeditation to this act. Um, she displayed consciousness of guilt, leaving the scene of the crime. 
uh, at the time of it happening. And I noted in all the reports, they, they said that a taxi driver had found her in a distressed state. A every descriptor of the state of mind that she was in was victim language. Mm -hmm. This poor woman, she was upset. Well, yeah, I guess you would be if you murdered your children. Uh, but anyway, let's start the discussion with this. There's a lot to unpack here. What do you guys think? You know, is, is this just another example of gynocentrism in action? Yeah, I'd add on to that, Paul, that she chose the time to kill them when the husband was not there. Mm -hmm. You know, and that shows that she kind of knew things. Plus, she left the children in such a way so that the husband was going to find them. To me, that's just evil, you know. It's sure. just evil. Uh, just, but to me, the the whole thing. I mean, we can see a lot of stories. In fact, we've had stories like this before. And but the important thing about this to me is that we're letting our culture condone stuff like this. It's not the people. It's not this woman. You know, it's it's our culture looks at it and goes, oh poor dear. You know, it's crazy. It's absolutely insane. You mm -hmm. know that you can do that. I mean, this woman. The trial has concluded actually, and they found her innocent by reason of insanity. And, yep. it's, and not only yeah. that, worse than that, you know, most of these people that get committed for reason of insanity stay there for years and years and years. But in this particular case, they said, she'll probably be out in a year. She'll well, probably be no out in a year. Killed. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Oh, yeah. God. Yeah. The, the um, I mean, there are so many questions about this story that are not answered in any of the news reports that for me, in some ways, is uh, at least as big a story as everything else. Uh, and may, it may be just that there is such a decline in journalism now that you can't expect to find clear, in-depth reporting. But yes. there are all sorts of uh, statements made in the reports that are never followed up, never clarified. So you really can't come to any kind of uh, full conclusion about what actually went on. And I would think that one of the purposes of journalism is to explain the workings out of the criminal justice system. And certainly that doesn't happen in this case. We're told at one point that the prosecutor said during the trial that you will hear varying accounts as to whether Ms. Morley knew what she did was wrong. Of course, this is a key issue with a um, you know defense of not guilty by reason of insanity. Now, I make the disclaimer. I don't really understand anything about these legal processes, so everything I'm saying is is you know just speculative and and based on my own ideas and and also I don't really have any understanding of of the various uh, mental disorders that it said she suffered from. I'm sure many of our listeners know more about depression and bipolar disorder than I do, but. Uh, you know, as far as I understand it, bipolar disorder and depression, she was variously diagnosed with those two. Um, they don't necessarily, in fact, in most cases, I think they don't mean that you are not aware of the distinction between right and wrong, uh, that you, you know, aren't aware of the nature of your actions. I could be wrong about that, but that is one of the key fundamental criteria for a finding of not guilty by reason of insanity. We never do hear much about the diagnosis. We never hear anything about whether she knew the difference between right and wrong. Certainly, as, as you said, Paul, this is a woman who left a note saying, I'm sorry, which suggests that she did know what she was doing, the, the horrific nature of her act. As you said, Tom, she left the children for her husband to find. Uh, and yet uh, the emphasis in the news reporting is on how she was distraught, she was distracted, she was disordered. Well, okay, yes, she'd taken a bunch of drugs and I think she drove her car into a tree or something like that. Well, naturally she would be, but she, this was somebody who was so in control of her actions that her husband left to go on a work trip thinking that she was perfectly fine. So she was in control enough that she um, you know, ha ha um, disguised her intent from him. We know that she had formed the intent to murder her children. She did um, Google searches uh, about you know different ways to kill them. She had previously the night before tried to kill them by drugging them. Uh, she ended up of course suffocating them. 
I don't see where the insanity comes in. Um, apparently another factor in um, insanity is that you cannot control your actions. Uh, you know, that you can't hold yourself back from doing the thing that, that you in, or do. Uh, and, and, but that doesn't seem to have been the case at all either. So it's, um, well, it is certainly striking the depth of compassion that exists out there in the world for women who do terrible things. And it's also, to me, very disturbing that we can't even get a clear discussion of it in newspapers. So I have no idea why the um, medical authorities who tested testified at the trial said that she was insane. None of that is made clear. It's not even clear to me that there was any kind of disagreement between the prosecution and the defense in this case. I, I read that the prosecution agreed with the defense that a right. finding of not guilty was appropriate. Why even have a trial if there is not even a disagreement? I, I just I, I found the whole thing utterly confusing. And when you're confronted by such a repugnant incident, and then to have no clear airing of the logic of what happened to that woman. And now she's, of course, going to be placed in a psychiatric institution. And we're told that she may be there really very briefly. It, it just leaves one feeling that, well, just that our society has completely lost its moorings. And that the thing, you know, that, that horrors that one would expect to be universally condemned are, as you said, Tom, instead condoned. Yeah, if she, if she had been a man, imagine what would have happened. <laughs> All hell would have broken loose. We a very different discussion yes, about this. Yes, and the thing that's really striking to me is that I've read a lot of articles on this, and very few of them mention, even mention the husband. You know, a couple of them said, you know, that he was having difficulties, but I didn't ever see him quoted in any way. Um, there were a couple that talked about him uh, tangentially, but think about that. I mean, no one says anything about the husband. If it had been I reversed, did it, a couple who did quote him is saying some very deep grief, and uh, I think he used the term "every breath is a struggle." He was quoted in a, in a couple of places like that. Hmm. But I had the same result, Tom. Looking through all the stories, there was he was an afterthought. Yes, in the story. If this had been reversed, the whole story would have been about the mother. Yes. The whole thing would have been about the, oh, the grieving mother, you know, and this yeah. asshole that did this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just yeah. so stark. It just, ugh. I think, I mean, there are... part, of, part of what's happening with the verdict here is really simple. I mean, the jury is supposed to have to decide and the prosecution is supposed to prove, and I think it would have been easy to prove in this case, premeditation, consciousness of guilt, everything that goes into an insanity plea not working. But at the end of the day, you've got jurors sitting there in the box looking at a mother who's murdered her children and wanting to find any explanation for this other than pure evil. And so when they, they, when they have the option to find that she's not guilty based on insanity, they tend to do it. They did that uh, in a second trial with Andrea Yates in Houston. She yeah. ended up in a psychiatric facility. She did the same thing as Morley here. She waited till the husband was out of the house. She sh she fled the scene afterward. She had to, she drowned all five of her children, forcing them all into bathtubs. One of the children she had to drag by his feet down the hallway as he's kicking and screaming, trying to get away. All of these involve a multitude of conscious decisions, one after another, yes. that can only mean culpability and yes. guilt. Yes. And and but people just when it comes to women, is they look the other way. Yep. And um, you know, she could have turned this same crazy, insane range on her husband and killed him. She would have probably walked away from that as well. Yeah, she had a moment of psychosis. You know, and they talk about her getting medication after this incident, after killing the kids. She got this medication the week after, and her response was, oh, if only I had this medication before, none of this would have happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that, that and, the, uh, the now phrasing I'm of all that. better. And so they're yeah, taking that yeah. and twisting it and saying, well, then she must be all better. We can let her go within a year. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, the, the wow. phrasing of that I found really chilling that she says, oh, if I'd had this wonderful medication earlier, things might have been very different. Yep. Uh, you know, yep. the, the seeming um, complete inability to even, I don't know, internalize what she's done or care about it mm -hmm. really is is quite shocking. And and uh, I, I sent this article actually to a friend of mine who's very interested in these kinds of true crime stories and and looking at what happens when people get away with you know really horrific actions. He didn't feel it was a gendered issue. He thought it had more to do with uh, our society's response to the idea of insanity and, and mental illness. And he sent me back some stories about men who had done similar hor horrific things and had received uh, not guilty verdicts. And, and there was a case in, in BC, for example, of a man who was killed on a Greyhound bus about 10 years ago. Uh, he was asleep on the bus, the guy sitting next to him, uh, uh, you know, started stabbing him and eventually cut his head off and consumed parts of his face in an absolutely mm. horrific crime. Yeah, while everybody else on the bus did nothing, well, raced off. I guess I can't blame them for that. I probably would have raced off myself, but it was just absolutely horrific. And uh, and he received, uh, you know, he was he was considered not guilty and and went into a psychiatric institution. And although not within a year, but within a fairly short time, he was he was allowed out. Huh. Um, but but, but I don't. Know, if you look at the circumstances of something like that, and this, and I've seen lots of psychotic people in my time, when they're that crazy when they're psychotic it doesn't matter the the bus could have been filled with police officers and yeah. it wouldn't mm -hmm. have stopped or they would have stopped what happened but it wouldn't have stopped that individual from starting the attack uh, right that that example you gave to me is an evidence of insanity in that case not so with this woman i think the guy gave you a bad example yeah, I mean, and and also I would say I mean I agree with you in in the, the case in the Greyhound bus. Obviously, that guy was not aware of his circumstances at all. He was acting upon a voice from God telling him to kill this person, and he had right. his whole bizarre rationale. Whereas this woman planned, you know, the and you know very clearly planned so that she would be able to to carry it out and was clearly conscious of her circumstances and surroundings and, and everything else. And, and the other difference of course, is that nobody talked about what a wonderful man, the killer of the, on the Greyhound bus was. Nobody talked about the kindness in his eyes and how he had spent his life helping people as was the case in the Twitter response we saw. Do you have those Tom, just to, just to show, I mean, it, it's, it's startling the, the depth of compassion that some people will feel welling up in them. What, looking at this woman's face and claiming to be able to see in her eyes some kind of deep love for humanity, it's its quite striking. Yeah, the one we have is um, this one here. Remember the first tweet said something like, um, I can understand this whole thing. And, you know, the real victims are the husband and the children. And then mm -hmm. this tweet comes in. I'm not so sure about him. Yeah, that's right. Like, yeah. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh. Yeah. So yeah. So immediately, uh, understanding of what she has done, and a suspicion of him, and a desire to point the finger at him as somehow responsible. Yeah. Yep. That that yep. too is just all too automatic. Typical. It's automatic. Yeah. Absolutely yep. insane. <laughs> Amazing. And that yeah. narrative will continue to surface, I'm sure, as people discuss this case and others like it. That happens every time. I Again, I'll go back to the Andrea Yates case. I got a haircut a week after her children were murdered, and my uh, the woman cutting my hair said, you know, they say it was the father's fault. <laughs> Just like that. Mm -hmm. Needless yeah. to say, she did not get a tip that day. Uh, but... <laughs> I mean, that, that yeah. is the, the attitude. That's the default. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. what it comes yep. down to. Men have agency, women have patience. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. And, crazy. and carrying on that thread, should we move on to the, the example of the false accuser who got a suspended sentence? Because it's quite something, too. Oh, boy, it really <laughs> is. And again, mm -hmm. it's, now this... it's. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, this is in BC, so we've moved from Ireland to a uh, small town just outside of Victoria, BC, uh, where a woman who um, maintained a false 
uh, uh, false story about being raped at knife point, she claimed. So this was not just, uh, you know, I didn't consent. This was supposedly uh, an acquaintance forcing her at night knife point to drive from the parking lot where he jumped into her car back to his home where he then raped her. A pretty serious charge, which uh, was immediately called into doubt by the fact that the police looked at the security cameras in the uh, parking lot and, hey, there was no guy there, no guy, no <laughs> knife, no nothing. Uh, she drove over to his house of her own volition, obviously, uh, interested in the young man uh, who was not her boyfriend. And I think that tells us a lot about her motivation for the lie. Uh, and uh, But then she still maintained the story. Oh yeah, she made up the part about the knife, but he really did rape her anyway. And uh, <laughs> they brought the man in for questioning. Uh, the other thing about this is that again, there is not enough information offered in the story. It's all about her once again, and about how much she has suffered, how she's learned a lesson, how young she was, how inexperienced she was. It's all about the defense story about her. Nothing about what actually happened to the guy. I don't even know if he spent any time in jail. I don't know how seriously the charges against him were pursued. Certainly we, we know that for a period of weeks, about three weeks, she maintained this false story. And finally then, when I guess confronted with all the discrepancies by the police, she confessed that it was all made up. And then she received this very light sentence. But again, I find it bizarre that we don't even know if the prosecution offered a um, like a, a, a differing account of the crime. We have her defense lawyer telling us, oh, she, you know, there were questions around consent and she didn't think she'd be believed. And it's all the story about how she's the victim because she was young, because this bad thing happened to her and therefore she had to lie because we know that victims are not believed and so none of it's her fault and it's that. been a learning experience and even the 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 crown prosecutor seems sort of sorry for her and you know feels the need to explain why they pressed any charges at all and they the the, the crown prosecution didn't even attempt to have her put in jail even for a few days as a result she's of a, a very young, malicious lie. Yeah. She, she's mm -hmm. a really pretty boy. You can't lock people up like that. Oh, by the way, people should know her name is Anna Kobayashi. We should say that mm -hmm. out loud. There's her image right there on the, should be the lower left portion of your screen. Um, and her her attorney, I, I loved his, his phrasing of things. He said she amplified her story. <laughs> Which is lawyer ease for she lied her ass off. <laughs> but she amplified. Oh, her God. Story. She created a, 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 a kidnapping somebody at knife point. That's aggravated kidnapping and sexual assault. That's 20, yeah. 30 years in prison for the guy if they happen to, to have any. And imagine if he had gone out to her car with her. Uh, if he had gotten in the car at the same time she said he did, this guy mm -hmm. would be in very serious trouble right now. Just that yeah. alone. It would, and even with video evidence, and I love, you said it perfectly, Janice, she had to lie because people don't believe rape victims. <laughs> I mean, that, was, that should be the motto for, for me too. We had to lie. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, people wouldn't believe us. And she lied mm -hmm. twice. You know, they caught her with the first one with the tapes yeah. from the parking lot. And she said, oh, but I had to, you know, because I didn't think you'd believe me. But he, he I went there, but he raped me. Then they went and talked to the guy and he gave them conflicting evidence. And they said, oh, we, and so they called her back and said, you know, we've got this evidence. Then she said, yes, I made it up. It was consensual. It's like, it's like, oh, my gosh. Well, I don't even think she ever does. It. Oh, sorry. No, and no, she said the whole thing was a lie. She admitted it. Well, she admitted that she lied. I don't think that she ever admitted that it was consensual because that was the That's story that her d defense lawyer was going yes. for, was that there were some, there were issues of <laughs> consent. 
you know, so so essentially she continued to maintain yeah. that she had been raped in some form, that she had not consented, you know, every three minutes during the encounter. And therefore, this guy deserved to be put in jail. And and even the prosecution, ne as far as the report went, never really offered an alternative theory never said she outright lied she lied because she was cheating on her boyfriend or she didn't want her parents to know or something i mean there are a number of issues there that seem to explain why she made up this lie and maintained it over a period of three weeks this seems to me absolutely outrageous and yet even the crown prosecutor is a little bit shamefaced in it, trying to explain why they decided to press charges at all, even for a suspended sentence and 50 hours of community service. And we have to read a report that ends with a little paragraph about how rare false accusations are. Uh, let's see. Well, if we except can for find this it. story. <laughs> yeah, except for this one. <laughs> Oh, but, but, you know, that was in Kanan's research on false allegations. This is one of the reasons that he came up with. I mean, there's uh, women falsely accused men of rape as an alibi, as a, sometimes a matter of revenge for being rejected, but often to cover an affair. And yeah. this is exactly what appears to have happened in this case. It is, uh, oh, God. Yeah, why don't you read that, Tom? So we can get the benefit right. from the wisdom in that. Oh, this is this is a winner. False. This is at the end of the article, right? False accusations about sexual assault are rare. Okay, we could stop right there. One UK study <laughs> found that actual malicious reports were about three percent. Teenage girls represented a large number of those deemed to have deliberately made false reports of sexual assault, often to cover up behavior that would have gotten them into trouble, such as missing a curfew or skipping school, according to a 2017 report by the U.S. National Institutes of Health. Hmm. Well, look, folks, even if it is 3%, that's still... Three, that's a lot of guys out there who are, who are getting screwed. Well, yeah, if you listen to feminists about how often women get raped, exactly. yeah. the percent of mm -hmm. that is like millions. thousands and thousands and thousands. <laughs> yeah, it is th like thousands and thousands every year. If, if, you know, if one in four women is raped in her lifetime, how many men then are falsely accused? An awful lot. So, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. this is not a small problem, and I really do not appreciate at the end of a story in which we never hear anything about the guy. We really don't know what happened to him, how this impacted him, uh, you know, what, what, his, what hell he went through during Sewers. that three weeks while he yep. was being, who knows how many times questioned, how many times threatened with, uh, you know, his whole life being turned upside down. Nothing about that. And yet we're, we're lectured to at the end about how we shouldn't take this too seriously because it doesn't happen very often. And when it does, it's because the girl was a victim and she was young and inexperienced, whatever that means. <laughs> I'm sure her I'm sure her boyfriend wished she was inexperienced and had decided not to go over and visit another guy and have sex with him and then claim that he raped her. I mean, it, it's really Amen. just yeah, that's the um, truth. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I'd like to find out if this clown is still with her, but that's just me. Well, who knows? The well, Facebook that, and page. that is part of the problem. By the way, folks, that 3%, personally, I think it's bullshit. Canaan studies put false accusation rates closer to 40%. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of prosecutors and police that will quietly uh, affirm that number. But they won't do so do so very much publicly because of the backlash that will the hell that will rain down on them if they tell mm -hmm. the truth about the rate of false accusations of rape. Canceled. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. I, I, you know, and problem. like everybody, everyone assumes that um, the, the that three percent must refer to cases where charges are dropped or cases where the man is found not guilty, you know, that, that kind of thing. It doesn't, it only refers to cases where the woman has admitted that right. she lied. There right. are so many other cases where the woman maintains the story 
and it, it, it can't be proven. And as you said, Paul, the police aren't very interested in most cases in right. pursuing these charges of false allegation. So there are so many other cases where we don't know whether the allegation was false. There may even be cases where the women believed that they were sexually assaulted, but they were not actually. Well, that isn't a false allegation exactly, but it's still a case where an innocent man is railroaded through charges and often is convicted in the end because we place so much faith in the woman's word. So yeah, to, 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 to I, I just find it infuriating to be lectured at the end of an article about an egregious lie told by a woman uh, to be t lectured to that we're not to take this very seriously because it's so rare. Yep. It's it's uh, it's amazing. And even in again, you know, in the course of the article, as you read it, it's all about the woman like the defense counsel will will never talk about her crime, even though she admitted lying. It just says that she made a mistake and she's well aware that she made a mistake and her life has already been impacted by this mistake that she made. And we want her to have just the 50 hours of community service because she wants to be able to start with a fresh, a fresh start. She's gonna pursue a nursing career. That's an interesting theme that oh, connects this with the previous story. <laughs> this, this woman's gonna be a nurse as well. It reminds me of a tweet that uh, Milo Yiannopoulos made a, a while ago that I retweeted and boy, did I ever get a lot of hostile reaction. He tweeted, you know, in order deliberately to provoke, he said that, you know, all the praise of nurses during COVID-19, he felt was misplaced because many nurses are control freaks who are only in the profession because they want power over others. And they're really very <laughs> horrific people. Now, I'm not saying that that's true about nurses in general, although <laughs> I'm sure there are many very good nurses. Yes, Tom will affirm this. If you visit any psychiatric ward in any hospital, you will find control freak nurses in charge there, and they can be some of the most vicious, destructive forces in the lives of their patients. Uh, and I've seen it a hundred times over. Well, I've certainly had some extremely unpleasant experiences with nurses in regard to my mother's uh, hospital care. And I know that uh, Tom, your your uh, your partner is a is a nurse, and I'm sure she's a very good one. I'm sure there are many good ones, but I think that <laughs> Milo had his finger on something, and the viciousness of the response that I received when I retweeted it, uh, including by some very foul mouthed nurses, seemed to affirm that. But <laughs> yes. uh, anyway, uh, that's that's neither here nor there in a way. The hospitals it, I've worked in link. would agree with Paul. I mean the 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 psych hospitals I've worked in, the nurses have been difficult. Let's leave it like that. <laughs> One of the things that happens regularly in psych psychiatric environments is that what the people working there allegedly attempt to do is to keep things peaceful above all else. You, you, you try to monitor things for friction points and try to keep patients who have mental health issues from escalating into violence or doing self-destructive things. And you can see nurses in those units across the United States provoking those patients, instigating problems with them, and then ordering the psych techs, the muscle on the exactly. unit restrain them so they can force medications on them. I saw that happen over and over and over and over again. It's so, awful. Nurse so did I. Addiction. Yeah. I saw the same thing. In fact, I got into big trouble in one of the hospitals I worked in because I refused. I said, no, I'm not doing that. You can forget about it. And they tried to fire me for uh, a year. And in fact, at that point, this was in the 70s, the uh, ACLU took my case and uh, the hospital mm, backed wow. down after a year. But I mean, yeah, that's exactly the kind of thing that goes on over and over again. You know, this the nurses get into these power struggles with the usually it's the the male patients, and then they call in the guys to you go do this, you know, take care of this. You know, it's like what? Because the guys would have done things very differently with the with the fellow. You know, I mean, we usually had a good relationship with them. You know, good enough, and uh, we knew how to calm them down. You know, if we needed to. Anyway, that's neither. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I really. When a charge nurse decides they want a patient in a seclusion room, they're going to end up there whether they need to be or not. Right. Exactly. 
Yeah, and I was shocked at the contempt with which nurses treated, especially male patients, um, mm -hmm. because my mom was on a number of wards where her person in the bed next to her was male. And I noticed, a, I mean, I didn't think that the nurses were very kind to my mother either. Mm -hmm. I, they, they often were very impatient and um, condescending towards her as an elderly person. I don't, I don't think they have a lot of interest in the elderly, um, but it, particularly I, I, I saw them laughing at uh, the male patient, I thought they treated him with disregard and indifference for his humanity. Mm. It, it was really shocking to see. Yes, yes. Anyway, but yeah, that's, that's maybe another, yeah, maybe another discussion. Well, it's the same stuff, though. It's the exact same stuff. You know, the culture holds men as having agency and does not think about giving them compassion or empathy. You know, it's just, a, it's the bottom line. Uh, and it's really ironic that in environments like that, that's exactly right, Tom, the male patients will be held to account a hundred times more than female staff members who are allegedly <laughs> healthy. The old joke from psychiatric units is, what's the difference between the patients and the staff in a psych hospital? Well, eventually the patients get better and go home. Um, <laughs> Yeah. yeah, there you go. Interesting environment, it really is. Yeah. Well, and it was certainly, I mean, I found it flabbergasting to see in this story about the false accuser, uh, everybody sort of agreeing that her attempt to put an innocent man in jail should be just quickly got past. You know, let's get let's get over it as quickly as possible. Have her do her hours of community service so that she can start in on her nursing career. Great, yep. just the kind of person I want when I'm when I'm sick in bed. Somebody who, uh, uh, you know, can 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 sort of blithely imagine lying to the police about a, uh, such a serious subject as, as you said, Paul, like you know, aggravated kidnapping and aggravated assault, and then plays the victim when she finally has to confess at the end that she made the whole story up. Yeah. Ah, oh, but that's another day in a blue pill world. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. we have red pills. Yep. Indeed. So I guess, well, that brings our not very cheery discussion to an end, I think. And, uh, <laughs> but we will end on an up note by saying that men are good how about yeah, that that's, that's a three in a row no we're come on join a us roll for sure board. it sucks link below come join us the groups are fantastic <laughs> matter of fact we're having a community meeting tonight should be uh, fun for all of our members and uh we will see you guys next time all righty you all, all right. take care have a great week we'll see take you bye-bye